In this next video for Introduction to Neuroscience, we're going to be talking about the coordinates of the body and the nervous system. The reason we have to do this is because in order to talk about anything, we need to have some lay of the land and a couple of different words so that we know where we're at when we're talking about something. In the same way that if you were uh, lost and asking directions to somebody else, you need to kind of agree on certain things like what is north and what is south, what is west, what is east. And if you don't agree on these terms, it's going to be really hard for you to understand and give directions to anyone. So I'm going to give you the tools to understand understand the terminology for thinking about the different coordinate systems of the brain. And once you have this terminology, you'll be able to describe more precisely where we are in the brain and thinking about it at a systems level. So we can start with a picture of a dog, like the following one. And the basic words we're going to learn are there's a front to back axis, which we call anterior for front and posterior for back. This is often sometimes called rostral caudal as well. And these mean exactly the same thing. Rostral is anterior, rostral for nose. And caudal is posterior, caudal, caudal means tail. So this is known either as the AP, anterior posterior axis, or sometimes people equivalently call it the rostral caudal axis. They mean the same thing. Next, we have orthogonal axis, the AP axis, the DV axis, the dorsal ventral axis. Dorsal means back, so it's towards the back of the dog. And ventral means belly, and so that is the, the other side, the downside of the dog. Okay? So we have AP axis, anterior, posterior, DV axis, dorsal to ventral. If you think about the nervous system of the dog, we have a little brain and we have the spinal cord. The same thing applies to the organization and the coordinate system of the brain. So there's the AP axis of the brain, front to back. There's also the dorsal and ventral axis of the brain from top to bottom. Okay, everything works so far. This is totally good. Everything's good here. The same thing applies. These four words and these axes apply anytime you have a reasonably bilaterally symmetric animal. And so these axes work perfectly well if you're talking about an uh, invertebrate insect, for example. So here we have a, we have a cricket. Um, it has an AP axis and a DV axis just like our dog did. Totally exactly the same words with exactly the same meanings. It even has a very analogous system in its central nervous system with a brain, which is in its head. It's slightly different looking, but it's in its head. And instead of having a spine, it has what's called an eventual nerve cord. Now, invertebrates, like this insect here, are different from vertebrates like us in that their spine, instead of going down the dorsal back, the dorsal end, um, instead of going down their back, it's actually in their belly. So it's called the ventral nerve cord. Computationally and architecturally, they have a lot in common. They just, you know, they evolve separately, and so they're in a different part of their body. Our digestive tracts are in the ventral side, and our nervous system's on the back. For insects, like this one, it's the opposite. Uh, but other than that, that they're opposite parts of the body, it's actually exactly the same. Their digestive system is, is on the dorsal side instead. If you think about a human, now, we have the inconvenient fact that humans have decided to be bipedal. And so the terminology for a human, I always introduce after I introduce the terminology for animals that are kind of down in their feet, like dogs and horses and bears, for example, because it's a slightly more confusing. Now, you kind of have to think about a human as if we were on the ground on all fours, like you know, if you're playing with your dog, you're down on all fours playing with your dog, right? And so because we have stood up and become bipedal, the orientation of our brains has remained the same with respect to gravity. And so you still have the anterior posterior axis of the brain. This is exactly like the same as dogs and rats and all the rest, and the dorsal ventral axis of the brain, okay? But what you've noticed is that this, these axes are now different from the rest of the body because dorsal ventral, the back, you know, my back, and ventral, my belly, is now pointed horizontally with respect to gravity as opposed to the case of the dog where dorsal was up and ventral was down. And my anterior posterior axis for the rest of my body that's not my head, the rostral caudal axis, is now also stood up on its end. So it's no longer anterior and posterior, right? I'm using slightly different words here. And actually, I've, I've learned by talking to some of my human physiology colleagues that they actually have different words sometimes that they use for describing this if you're talking about human anatomy. Here, I'm primarily interested in the organization of the nervous system. And so I'm emphasizing the coordinates we use to, to describe the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord. And so you just kind of have to, to keep track of what's going on here, depending on which part of the nervous system you're talking about, if you're talking about a human. When I'm talking 
talking about it because I'm a neuroscientist instead of a, uh, an anatomist for humans. I'm mostly thinking about what human nervous systems have in common with other animal systems. And so to make this terminology most consistent, I'm going to just kind of assume that human is on all fours, um, just like a rat or a dog would be, rather than standing up, okay? So anterior is anterior with respect to the brain, and then anterior for the spine is actually pointing up, even though it kind of goes up and then it curves a little bit to sideways, okay? Slightly confusing, but I think overall I'm glad I'm standing up on my two feet. Okay, there's one more axis that's relevant here, which is, I pointed it earlier, that this applies for bilaterally symmetric animals like ourselves. We have a left half and a right half. And that means that in addition to having the dorsal ventral axis and the anterior posterior axis, we have another axis, which points out the fact that there is a line, a midline, where things are symmetric, the left and the right half of our bodies, they're pretty similar. And so there's a medial lateral axis. Medial means closer to the middle, and lateral means off to the edge. So there's a medial axis, which everything towards the middle, and then there's lateral to the left and also lateral to the right. The brain and the spinal cord, highlighted in yellow and in pink there in that diagram, is what we mean by definition as the central nervous system. The remainder of your nervous system, the nervous system that innervates the rest of your body, is typically known as the peripheral nervous system. That's a piece of terminology that will come in handy as we go down the next couple of lectures in thinking about systems neuroscience as well. So I just wanted to be clear what I mean by central nervous system and what I mean by the peripheral nervous system. There's a bit more terminology here. I'm gonna look at a picture of a brain. Um, and so in addition to establishing the axes, dorsal, ventral, anterior, posterior, this is a side view of the brain. So you can't really see the, uh, the medial lateral because it's kind of inside the screen right now. We also have a couple of words that are important to know because we're going to be looking at this three-dimensional structure and cutting it into different slices. And all of those slices have different names. Now, because there's three orthogonal axes, I also have three different slices for the brain and they all have different names. I'm just gonna go through them and tell you what they are. The first one is what's called a coronal section. And this is the diagram of what it looks like. Hopefully this is intuitive. I'm gonna try to demonstrate it on my own head right now by standing sideways, the coronal section is if I slice up my brain this way, okay? I can also slice my brain horizontally. Now, this is horizontal with respect to gravity, if you can kind of imagine that. If you can imagine your brain, and if I'm gonna take a knife, don't recommend it. If you take a knife and slice your brain kind of parallel to gravity right here, this is called the coronal section. The only axis that's left is the one where you're cutting the brain in half, left and right, kind of right down the midline right here. Any cut that's parallel to the midline is gonna be called a sagittal section. There's a mid-sagittal section if you count right down the middle. And if you cut parallel to the mid-sagittal section, but a little bit off to the side, you have what are called parasagittal sections. So these are the terms. We have coronal section, horizontal section and sagittal section. These are the common sections that we talk about when we think about the brain. And if you cut up different mammalian brains using the same sections, you actually see that they have a lot in common. I've seen a lot of coronal sections of bats that look exactly like coronal sections of rats, which look very similar to coronal sections of humans, for example, although there are some differences. So there's a couple more things that are interesting to think about the brain. Over there, we see a side view of a human brain, and there's a couple of anatomical parts that I just wanted to point out. We're gonna be talking about a lot of these different anatomical areas in more detail later, but I wanted to give you kind of the lay of the land, kind of where the big landmarks are first, so that when we talk about it over and over again, you'll have building on that knowledge instead of just hearing these words for the first time. This is a uh, MRI of a human brain in the mid-sagittal section. And so the sagittal section, because the brain's been cutting half, kind of like this, okay, down the middle. And what you'll see here is that it actually has a couple of different parts of it and that are distinct from each other. And so I'm just gonna name them and we'll talk about what they do a little bit later. So this is just the anatomy part. You'll see here that the spine, the spinal cord is going down right here, okay? The spinal cord is connected to the very bottom of the brain, the brain stem. And the brain stem then connects to kind of the midbrain areas. What is in the very back of your brain is a structure, a fascinating structure called the cerebellum. You can see the cerebellum kind of sticking out underneath the rest of the brain right here. This part of the brain is called the cerebellum. And what's on top of all of those midbrain structures is the cortex. Cortex means outside, right? And that's kind of what all you see when you're looking at the side view. All you see is the cortex, the outside of the brain. Now, the cortex is wrinkly in humans because it is actually a two-dimensional sheet 
that is really large. Uh, it's about the size of a large dinner napkin if you, if you shook it out. And so the reason it's wrinkly is because it's a two-dimensional sheet that got crumpled up and stuffed on top of the midbrain structures. And so it has to be wrinkly, otherwise it wouldn't fit. Not all mammalian brains are wrinkly. In fact, lots of them aren't. If the relative area is not that big, then it just isn't wrinkly. Rats and mice, for example, do not have wrinkly brains. They're totally smooth, and you can see all of it as a two-dimensional sheet by looking at it, and that's not the case with human brains. There are even some primate brains that are not wrinkly, um, that are not that don't have sulci and gyri, and so it's not necessarily something that is uh, that is unique to to humans. Okay, so there are primates that have uh, wrinkly brains, and there's some primates that don't have wrinkly brains. This is something that lots of people study. We are going to think a little bit about. Um, I'm going to talk about something that my, my students usually ask me in this class, which is, what is so special about human brains? Okay, This, this turns out to be a, a question that is surprisingly difficult to answer because it's been hotly debated for decades. Lots and lots of people have proposed lots and lots of things about what is so special about human brains. And one of the things that you may have heard about that popularly talked about is the fact that we have prefrontal cortices, frontal cortices in the very front of our brain that's kind of associated with higher cognitive functions, for example, is particularly well developed. It turns out that there's not a lot of quantitative data to back up this hypothesis if you look closely enough. Because not only are you looking at the actual area of the frontal cortex of the human brain, what really seems to matter is the relative area of the frontal cortex of the human brain relative to the rest of the brain. After all, it wouldn't really matter because you know, if you had a, a smaller total area and everything is smaller, it doesn't, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense to be looking at the absolute area of the frontal cortex. You should be looking at the relative area. And if you look at the relative area of the human frontal cortex relative to both our closest ancestors, or the other primates, as well as some more distant uh, relatives, such as the mouse here, there is no consistent systematic trend in supporting the hypothesis that we are more special than some of the, these other relatives because our frontal cortices are bigger. Nevertheless, it remains the case that humans do seem to be special as animals on Earth because nobody has built cities and lightboard studios and YouTube. Um, we're kind of special in that we have accomplished those things. And so it's unclear with the neuroanatomical basis what makes us special, but I think, you know, maybe, maybe I'm kind of full of it. I'm full of myself. I feel like I'm special, and maybe you feel like you're special too. And so the quest for figuring out what it is that makes humans special remains. Um, but I did want to tell you that whatever it is, it's not as simple as we have larger frontal cortices. That doesn't seem to be the answer. So before you feel too special, I also wanted to tell you this other thing, uh, which I think is a really curious observation on the topic of neuroanatomy. So here we have a, a kind of a typical brain scan of a, of a typical neurotypical brain. What you're seeing here is down here, you should recognize this is the sagittal section of a human brain. And up here is what's called a horizontal section of human brain. Okay, so this is the top one, is a slice of the brain kind of this way. And the bottom one is a mid-sagittal section where you're sliced uh, the left and right halves in half and open it up a little bit, virtually speaking. Okay? Now, this is what a typical brain looks like. What I'm going to show you here is a case that was written up in The Lancet a little bit ago. And the title of the paper is Brain of a White Collar Worker. What is remarkable about this brain scan is that this person came in to, uh, to, their, to their medical care professional complaining of some numbness of the arms. This is a fascinating short article, just like a page. I encourage you to read it if you really want to. And they complained of some numbness in their arms, some amorphous symptoms, and they were like, oh, let's, say you're, let's give you a brain scan just to make sure everything's okay, you know? And to their surprise, it looked like this person had approximately no brain. Those large black areas labeled LV, LV stands for lateral ventricle. We all have lateral ventricles, you do and I do. Usually they're small fluid filled chambers, you can kind of barely see them in, in this picture. In this particular person, their lateral ventricles, uh, they have a condition called hydrocephaly, which means the lateral ventricles usually produce a supraspinal fluid, and in their case, it was producing an excess of supraspinal fluid, but so slowly that it was building up pressure over decades, slowly squeezing out the rest of their brain so that they had almost no volume left for their brain. Their entire brain, as you can see, is almost entirely filled with fluid from the lateral ventricle. Now, you might think that this brain scan might be inconsistent with life, but in fact, this person is, you know, has been living for decades, is holding down a job in the civil service in France, that's why it's 
the title of the article is Brain of a White Collar Worker. They have a perfectly within normal range IQ when they gave them the IQ tests. They have a family, they have friends, they're walking around, like they seem perfectly normal within range of normal at least, despite the fact that their brain anatomy is very much not normal at all. So this, when I saw this, first of all, this was fascinating, right? And I think this is another case where it really made me question what is so special about the brain anyway? It turns out that if you can very slowly over the course of decades squeeze your brain so that instead of taking up all the space inside the cavity of your head, it's taking up very little of it, it's still okay kind of speaks to the remarkableness and remarkable resilience of this organ that you carry around in your head. Okay, so I'm gonna do the highlights here, and these are the key terminology to understand the coordinates of the nervous system. Um, keep these straight, because if you get them confused, we're gonna confuse each other a lot if we talk to each other. There's the dorsal ventral axis, the anterior posterior axis. I want to distinguish the difference between central nervous system and the nervous system, and, and the peripheral nervous system. You need to know the difference between medial and lateral. Now, there's one more thing I wanted to point out here about this, uh, this picture of the peripheral nervous system. Um, there is the part, the very, very back part, the very posterior part of your spine, instead of being a coherent cord, coherent spinal cord, it actually bifurcates and spreads out in this structure called a cauda equina because it resembles a horse tail. Look up a picture of a cauda equina. It is fascinating and slightly disturbing <laughs> is, the, is the word that I thought of when I first saw it. It's a really interesting structure anatomically. I like anatomy. Um, and speaking of anatomy, there's also kind of slices of the human brain that you should know about, the difference between a coronal section, a horizontal section, as well as a sagittal section. So the sort of the cheat sheet, there, this is all the terms that you need to know, and I'm gonna be using them, and if you read a paper, if you read a textbook on neuroscience, these are often the terms that you need to be able to keep straight in thinking about where we are in the brain. And you should be able to recognize the difference between, for example, a sagittal section and a coronal section, because they're gonna look really different, and you'll get really lost if you don't know which one is which. Okay, so these are all the coordinates we need. Now that we have the map coordinates, we can get started in thinking about systems neuroscience.